I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. Today, I'm remotely recording online with Todd Heisey, Canadian combat veteran and founder of the Veteran Hunters in Alberta. Veteran Hunters takes veterans and first responders suffering from PTSD and provides them with a positive experience and a supportive group. So Todd, you and I spoke earlier and the value that we're hoping to bring to our listeners here is we're hoping to talk about mental health and PTSD from your perspective, your journey that brought you to the inception of Veteran Hunters and what Veteran Hunters is and does. So Todd, welcome to the Silver Core Podcast. Travis, thanks for having me on and making time for this important issue with respect to mental health and particular mental health and veterans and first responders. You served in the Canadian military for some time and you're open about suffering from PTSD. Can, can you tell me a little bit about PTSD? Can you educate me and the listeners about, uh, at least from your perspective, PTSD? Sure. So I'll just talk a little bit about my experience and how I ended up getting diagnosed with, uh, with PTSD. So I served for a total of 22 years in the Canadian army, uh, mostly with the first battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian light infantry, just a little plug for, for the Patricia's. So yeah, no, uh, graduated Royal military college, served in both the regular and reserve army. Uh, like I said, for 22 years, 15 of that on full-time, full-time service served overseas, uh, three times. It was in my Kosovo tour in 1999 that, unbeknownst to me, that uh, when I got home, I was actually starting to suffer the early effects of, of PTSD. And then in um, 2001, I decided to uh, leave the Canadian military, and really it was the, the fight or flight aspects of, uh, of my PTSD that were causing me to have unbeknownst to me, mental health issues at that time. And uh, I left the Canadian Canadian Army the first time. And the medical system actually, in my departure medical, actually knew I had PTSD and actually withheld it from me. In fact, wrote in the margins on my medical records that, uh, that I had PTSD. Were I not getting out, they would have uh, been treating me for it. And then they went so far is that when I requested copies of my medical records later, they actually redacted those par- those portions so that I didn't even know that I had it. In Crazy. Yeah, so, and I'm not the only one that's had this happen to. It's been, um, it's an ongoing issue with the Canadian forces, in particular, a lot of issues that, that, that came out of the former Yugoslavia were medical conditions or periods of time were actually completely wiped clean of uh, military records. So that's a whole other story. But in my case, it was my medical records that were, uh, that were kept kind of from me. I got back in in 2007, got a letter from the Canadian Army asking me to come back with the war in Afghanistan. Didn't deploy to Afghanistan, largely because they started to, I and uh, others started to f- figure out that there was probably something wrong with my mental health at the time. Mm. That started kind of the long, the long process towards uh, treatment. It was actually a civilian mental health practitioner who was working with soldiers in another practice who was very interested in my military service. And he kind of put two and two together and said, hey, I think you have PTSD. And I was like, okay. So he encouraged me to put in uh, an application to Veterans Affairs for some kind of operational stress injury. At that time then, the Canadian Army didn't need me anymore. We were winding down from our tours in Afghanistan. So I transitioned to a job with oil and gas in Calgary and ended up getting put into the Operational Stress Injury Clinic here in Calgary and was one of the early intakes. And they diagnosed me with with PTSD and thus started the next six and a half years of, of treatment. In 2014, I was laid off with oil and gas and I kind of started the big downturn here in Alberta with respect to oil and gas. 
But I had a couple of different things that were going on at the same time. So one, I was being treated for my PTSD. And in my case, my PTSD didn't necessarily uh, resound from being shot at, you know, um, I was in a helicopter in Kosovo that took five, five rounds from a 12-7 up into the belly. Uh, we'd have little kids that would throw firecrackers at us with, you know, pieces of metal attached to it, etc. cetera. I'd, I'd previously served in Bosnia. One of the things that I'd been responsible for was doing the intelligence prep for battle going into, going into Kosovo, which we were sent into an area that had the bulk of the issues relating to the, the genocide in Kosovo. But also one of the things we, for those of us who had already been in the former Yugoslavia, we kind of had generalized culturally that they were going to be, the Kosovars were going to be very similar to the Bosniaks or the Croats or the Serbs that we, that we had dealt with. And I was sorely, sorely mistaken on that one. I had actually, in preparation to go over, I had actually found a German officer's diary and he'd served uh, in Kosovo. And a lot of the issues that he talked about logistically and then culturally with the with the locals, we actually encountered like decades later. Mm. Uh, we ran into all the same issues. So one of the things I found challenging over there was in the 1990s and going into early 2000, the, military, the Canadian military or Canadian army was still very you know, very political, senior leadership was very hesitant to make decisions. You know, we used to, we used to have a saying where, you know, better to be judged by 12 than carried by six, when the reality is was it was actually better to be carried by six than to, than to be judged by 12. Mm. And so we had a very, you know, gun-shy leadership. So when we went into Kosovo, the federal, federal government at the time, uh, the liberal government, had uh, <laughs> had restricted the number of guys that we could take. So, you know, so we had a battle group of just over 600. Now, when I went in there, uh, you know, I had seven jobs and no staff to do it because of the numbers. So I worked six months, 19 hour days. The five hours that I did get to sleep were not, were not uh, consecutive. And so basically when you're sleep derived, deprived your ability to make sound mental decisions or your ability, your, your brain's ability to, to cope with stress is greatly reduced. Sure. So couple that with, you know, leadership that is not making decisions. My bosses would not make decisions. So really it was left to me and two other captains to pretty much run this battle group. And as a result, we ended up basically getting PTSD as well as, you know, our, our careers end up getting sacrificed because of it, mm. but it was to do, but we did the right thing. You know, um, so I, so the attributes of my PTSD is I, so I have issues with authority. Sure. Um, I have issues. So I have, uh, anxiety. I have, uh, anger management issues. Uh, so I could go on. Um, there's about, there's about six different attributes of PTSD that I have. Mm. And they classified my PTSD as one of the most severe that they had seen at, at the time. Plus what made it more severe was that I went, you know, almost 15 years undiagnosed and untreated. Right. So in 2014, when I got laid off and was in treatment, what I was doing with Veterans Affairs was I was, I'd been in a, in a seven year um, battle, I'll use those terms appropriately, right. Battle with uh, the mid-level management within Veterans Affairs, and in, including my member of Parliament, Blake Richards and his staff, they were struggling to try and get into Veterans Affairs to look at um, because of my PTSD diagnosis. It was large, largely believed that you know I got my well, if I got my PTSD from Kosovo in '99, and I had a release medical in 2001, you know, uh, uh, that game, you know, yeah, that game. So should I have been medically released? So long story short, just so happens, you know, a total God thing I tell people, I, I happened to call into a local radio station here in the Calgary area, and Daniel Smith at the time was the, was the host. And she had Kent Hare, who was the new Minister of Veterans Affairs on there. And this was in 2014. So I hadn't, I hadn't been, been getting any funding yet from Veterans Affairs. So I'm on air with him and I'm bawling my eyes out. I burned through like a hundred thousand dollars of my life savings trying to support my family and I after getting laid off with oil and gas 
my treatment was in was in question because I'm trying to find jobs. And he basically, I put him on the spot and he had no choice but to say, hey, you know what, we're gonna help you. We're gonna go off air. He says, you're gonna give me, I'm gonna give you my executive assistant's phone number. You're gonna call her tomorrow. And wow. he says, we'll, we'll take it from there. And really, and, and he did follow through. Wow. He ended up organizing a meeting with the current um, Minister of National Defense. Interesting enough, we served together in Bosnia. Mm -hmm himself, uh, my member of parliament, and then he uh, basically told a bunch of generals to go on and redact my medical files, and they had a meeting in Ottawa, and it basically, it was a uh, holy crap when they saw what was written, and it was basically floodgates opened up, you know, put me in a rehabilitation and retraining program. Um, at the time, put me on the earnings loss program. They were likely facing a massive lawsuit if they didn't do something. So you know what? So. Um, but that was a you know that was a lengthy battle that took seven years to get to that moment, and that doesn't um, help PTSD. No, it doesn't, and that's one of the and that's one of the issues, and we can talk about that a little bit more when we talk about specifically about the veteran hunters. But mm -hmm. you know, a lot of guys are not in a in um, um, you know, frame of mind to be able to deal with a massive bureaucracy that is Veterans Affairs, right. and I had a. And I worked briefly for uh, for Parks Canada for about three months. Um, that was in a you know attempt for Veterans Affairs for me to see if I could get reintegrated back into the workplace. And my boss there had been a director in Veterans Affairs before coming over to Parks Canada. And she told me she said, you know, the issue with middle management in Veterans Affairs is that um, so Veterans Affairs is completely uh, managed out of Prince Edward Island. And it's staffed by people in Prince Edward Islands. So she goes, the issue is, is that the people from PEI who have jobs with VAC look at the issues and go, well, I have 20 years mm. to resolve this issue because they just look at it as a job. Right. But a, a veteran, we don't have 20 years. No, you some don't. Of us, some of us might not be here next week, let alone 20 years from now. And we have families and different things. And... So when, it was, when I saw that, I was like, whoa, you know, that's why some of us take seven years um, dealing with these guys and we, and, or, you know, I have other injuries, you know, like being in the infantry is really, it's like playing on a pro, a pro football team without padding. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I tell people. And we suffer like, you know, I tore my Liz Frank ligament. And if you look that up, that's a common NFL injury. That's usually a casting for eight weeks. Well, uh, I wrapped it with, t with a tensor bandage and took a bottle of aspirin and kept going. <laughs> and that resulted in the knee, left knee and hip issues. And I went to three hearings, um, three hearings on those, but was successful. So one of the things that I found was good was all of these struggles that I went through really helps me relate with, you know, with veterans. Um, Cause I've gone through many cases it's taken me longer and through more challenges to get the benefits that I have today. And so that puts me in a position where when I'm working one on one with veterans or talking to guys through um, our social media or they're, you know, we're just happening to be out hunting with the veteran hunters, it helps me better relate with guys. And then, uh, and I hope my experiences are able to encourage other guys so that they go, whoa. You know, t Todd went through way more than what I'm currently going through. So, you know, hopefully we can inspire and encourage, you know, other veterans to just stick with the fight. Suicide has been a huge issue. I know, I, you know, I, I talked to my American counterparts and we've got a really good relationship with a group like us out of, like the veteran hunters out of Oregon. I mean, they were seeing 22 a day. Now we're not seeing those numbers up here, but at Jeez. one point, you know, we were seeing probably four to five a week. Um, Jeez. One of my one of my hunter hosts, he's one of the few guys still alive from a platoon in Afghanistan. Those that didn't die in Afghanistan have taken their lives here. Um, well, before, you know, yeah. But before we go too far into yeah. the advent of uh, veteran hunters and looking at you as a role model for other people to be able to take their lead. You mentioned, you mentioned a lot of things here and there's. I'm, Sorry. Yeah. I, I know yeah. it's, it's, it's a huge, you know, it's a, it's a huge topic and I'm trying to, 
keep it it's, specific to me, but yeah. It's massive. And I got to, you know, maybe I'll just jump right into this question. As you're sure. going through that, it's very clear to me that you've said this before and you've told this before. And the tone, the pitch, the verbal, the paraverbal, uh, there are instances of activation that, that you can see as, as you're going through it, the areas that are going to be yes. more difficult to talk about. Do you find it's like going down a dirt road where you end up wearing some ruts in it and the more you go down that same road, the more you keep going in those same ruts and you start ingraining the same sort of, uh, physical and psycho psychophysiological responses to what you're talking about. Like, is it difficult to go through and talk about this over and over again? Well, in some ways, yes. And in some ways, no. So, I mean, while we've been talking about this, so I've been having like mental flashbacks to all of the conversations and all the incidences right. of everything. Um, about it. But one of the things I've learned is that, you know, so the whole time I'm, I'm talking about it and we're doing this interview, I'm also, I'm also self-talking. So mm. in the back of my mind, I'm telling myself, you know what, it's okay. Like I know why I'm feeling these ways, but you know, the benefits outweigh the negative feelings I'm have. Like, you know, if I can encourage and inspire and help and serve others, then that's better than, you know, so yeah, so for half hour or so interview, you know, um, I can endure that and then decompress afterwards. Um, so, well, you you yeah. mentioned that at the beginning there, you three times overseas, 2001, left the military, but you said that you can look back now and see that at one point you were suffering the early effects of PTSD. Yes. At the time, you probably didn't recognize it. And maybe no. somebody listening to this podcast might be going through something similar and not recognize it. Would you be willing to identify some of those early effects of PTSD that with the benefit of hindsight, you're able to. Sure. To yeah. One at? of the things, one of the things I used to call it was passionate frustration. <laughs> I like and, that term. <laughs> yeah. And, um, cause I've always been a, when a, one of the things that's always frustrated me is that you know, as a leader is when the organization is not allowed to reach its max maximum potential because usually senior leaders are in the way. Um, so for me, you know, I recall, you know, having that passionate frustration was one of the early signs of having PTSD. And really that's a combination of, uh, I'll try and break it down into sentiments. So um, anxiety, fight or flight, there's a lot of anger, anger and frustration in there. So when I was in the, so when I was working in the civilian sector from 2001 till, uh, 2007, I either left organizations by choice or, or were, were laid off. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I didn't stay with an organization for very long. And that was also one of the indicators when I was doing the intake for the operational stress injury clinic here was, you know, how many jobs did you have in a given period of time? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I'm trying to remember now, but you know, I've worked for, I've worked for almost every oil and gas producer in the oil sands. So. Mm. If you were to know then what you know now, when you first saw those early signs, what advice would you give to somebody? What would advice you know, would you give to yourself? My dad told me when I was getting out, he's like, you know, well, what are you going to do? And I was getting out without even a plan. Mm. I just wanted out. Right. And so my advice to you or any of your listeners would be, you know, take a deep breath and stay in. Don't, don't leave out of anger or frustration. And I know it's hard because if you're early, if you're early onset, it's hard because all you want to do is just, is just get out, get away. I mean, for five years, I couldn't even stand to look at a uniform. Mm -hmm. And then I went, and then we go into Afghanistan. And then one day in, in August, 2006, four soldiers I used to serve, that I used to serve with died in one day. And that just, that changed. Now I wanted back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what? Just be patient, seek help, find the right people to talk to. And I, and I didn't, when I think back now, you know, I went to different people 
to try and get advice, but their careers had already been, their careers were already over. Mm -hmm. So there were guys in JTF2 that I knew, and that those were guys that I should have been talking to who are still serving and were having good careers. In fact, we were out bowling and, you know, spending time together. And my wife's actually um, related to one of the guys that was serving at the time. And those were the guys I should have been talking to and looking for some advice, not looking at guy, older guys whose careers were now over. So I would say, be patient, take a deep breath, try and get the medical system on side for you, and then reach out to guys whose careers are still moving forward and who you can trust. And, uh, and that's one of the things I think back now, and even my wife, we were, we were talking about it last week on our, kind of on our, on our date night, was that, you know, it was like, she even agreed. She was like, man, she was like, yeah, why didn't we, we, we sat down with that couple like all the time, like when it was her cousin. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know why I didn't even like talk to him. And because uh, he could have probably helped me out better than any of the other officers that I was talking to. So. Anyhow, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. Of course, but being able to share that with others can be helpful for sure. Yeah. Now, and I'm just speculating here a little bit, but yep. mental health has a social stigma attached to it. I mean, there, unfortunately, yes. it does, and people look at mental health as a as a bad thing. And, and you had mentioned that I was it the Lith Frank tendon is that what you called it yeah the list the, the liz frank yeah my liz left frank. Foot. yeah okay so yeah. You, you'd injured your liz frank tendon and if you were to go into a doctor and have them take a look at you a doctor could probably diagnose that there's a procedure for de being able to look at that yeah. and, simple x-ray and yeah right and you're saying what it's six to eight weeks put it in the cast and yeah there we go we know yeah. the process in order to be able to deal with an injury like that and if left unabated, it will develop into other things like knee and hip problems like it did in you. Um, sure. Different yeah. people with different uh, genetic makeups will, maybe they're more heavy set and they're going to need a little bit longer before they can put weight on it. Or maybe they're, uh, but these are all variables that we know about and it's right. easy to look at. With mental health, it seems that since there is this level of unknown, which is actually starting to get narrowed down, I mean, they're, they're learning more and more about how to uh, quantitatively and qualitatively defined the mental health. Yeah. But, but since it's sort of this more nebulous sort of thing, it, it seems that, uh, I don't know. And I, and I'm just speaking from observation here, but one of two things happen, either a, a people will, uh, look at it and be dismissive of it because they say, oh, I can't be anything. I can't see the issue. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. or. Uh, B, somebody who is suffering from mental illness may look at themselves as bad or wrong or something that, that needs to be fixed as opposed to this being a natural response, a natural psychological and physiological response to a stressor in a life, just like the Lith Frank, Liz Frank tendon, uh, being injured yep. from, from, yep. uh, too much stress or injury, however, however it yep. happened. Mm -hmm. And, and with that, I don't know, I, it can become, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you make, make a great, a great analogy there and I'll just, I'll just carry with sure. it. Like, you know, so with the Liz Frank, there's, you know, yeah, an x-ray shows it and there's a, there's a standard course of treatment, but if it doesn't get treated, then there's, there's consequences and, and mental health injuries like your brain. So the issue is, I mean, um, a people see, people see a cast. Mm -hmm. on an arm on or a leg right oh you know and it's and that injury is totally obvious right well we don't we don't physically see you know mental health injuries we see the, the consequence of it you know we mm -hmm. can see tremors or even while we're chatting you probably watch i you know i fidget my sure. wife gets nauseous all the time because i have one leg that just constantly moves and <laughs> and, I, and and it's funny you know and it's from all the shooting and training that i do sure if we're if we're watching a tv show and guys are shooting I don't even know, notice it, but my muscles are still flitching like I'm mm. shooting, shooting in the show. Mm. Um, and she goes, and she, and she totally notices it. And she's been, and she's been awesome. 
you know, I've given her over the years, you know, lots of cause to to leave, and a lot of guys do, and she hasn't. And um, you know, I thank God for that. That's massive. And I, th- and I thank and I thank her, and she's been really key to my to my treatment. So I'll back up a little bit. So, um, so, um, just like you know, the Liz Frank, you know, not getting properly treated, uh, and I ended up with left knee and hip issues. Well, mm-hmm. with your PTSD not getting treated. Then you end up with, so um, I have irritable bowel. Um, I have, uh, oh, I'm trying to think all the other consequences. So Veterans Affairs has a number of, I think six to 10 other illnesses that you can get just by having PTSD. Even if you're, and if your civilian doctor does the paperwork for it, they're like, yep, it's in that list of, six to ten right that we we know um because guys like me have slogged in the trenches Mm -hmm. going through this and they've made a lot of mistakes and i you know what i don't i don't fault the people that that helped treat me uh in the six and a half years i mean i was part of the plan Mm -hmm. you know i was part of the plan that you know todd isey was going back to the civilian workforce and you know that didn't work out and we can We'll talk about that in a bit. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, mental health injuries aren't usually seen. My mom saw me as a different person when I came home from Kosovo. Mm. Uh, I mean, she knew me. She knew me pre Kosovo. My wife and I had been dating before going to Kosovo. But you know, I mean, your family is the one who who knows you the best, right? So, mm-hmm. my mom actually was uh, played a role in talking to Veterans Affairs case management because she knew baseline Todd Heisey. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife knew PTSD Todd. Mm-hmm. And um, and we're talking about consequences too. You know, I raised three kids being undiagnosed with PTSD. So all three of them, unfortunately, whether it's, a, they're still doing studies to determine whether it's there's genetic genetics to PTSD, mm-hmm. um, but nurture versus nature, you know, each one of them have, uh, a couple attributes of my PT of my PTSD, and one of the things I will say you know, is the the treatment that that I have received from Veterans Affairs with respect to treating my PTSD is far and away superior to anything you will see in a provincial mental health system. It is absolutely really disgusting. Really, our provincial mental health programs, especially here in Alberta. I've seen, because um, Veterans Affairs didn't have much to, to give for my family. Mm-hmm. So a lot of what my kids got, their treatment was in the public system. And it is absolutely disgusting. In fact, mm. I personally know more about trauma treatment and therapy than the people being paid to do trauma treatment and therapy. I um, believe that. You know, and it's funny, I could feel that like right in my chest. It's like, oh my, you know, I could yep. feel that more than talking about Kosovo because it's just really, you know, um, it's just really bothersome about it. So, you know, I know veterans who I've hunted with, you know, complain about veterans affairs. Mm-hmm. And then, but I also have the, the privilege of being able to see the provincial public system. And I'm like, hey man, count yourself lucky that you did not get stuck in the provincial mental health system. You know, I mean, we when I first started, I was seeing a therapist twice a week. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I went six and a half years of treatment. That's like unheard of. Wow. Like you do the, you do the figure out the dollars and cents that, you know, Veterans Affairs had to pay to get me to a point where, you know, I could run a non-for-profit organization. Sure. And, and host guys for 75 days. Now, did I, do I get burnout? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and we can, we'll talk about that too. Well, yeah. So what, one thing that I've noticed, and you brought up a really interesting point and you're bringing up a whole bunch of points and I'm apolo- I'll apologize for interrupting, but I want to make sure we can no, touch it's all on good. Yeah, 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 no. Yeah. I want to make sure we touch on some of these points because I think they're important. So you mentioned about, uh, the nature and nurture and yep. your children having different symptoms of PTSD and, you know, from everyone's different, everyone's going to have different characterological or emotional or cognitive resiliences that'll allow them to 
react to stressors differently, but yep. historically speaking, PTSD was something that people looked at as, well, it's shell shock or it's a, it was under the DSM four, I think is a general anxiety disorder. DSM five, a few years ago, they brought it into yep. its own new category and it's more what the stressor related trauma and stressor related disorders, and it's constantly evolving and the criteria being a cluster disorder, cause it affects, there's a numerous, it's not just one yeah. thing, it's not just, Hey, I got a broken bone, right? It's got all these different parts. You got your stressor. And then from what I understand, we're looking at recurring thoughts, avoidance, hyper arousal, and you start putting yeah. all these things together yeah. and they, they say, Hey, let's call that PTSD. The fact that it's being taken outside of just those who are uh, in the military or first responders or in these hugely traumatic situations, yeah. uh, I, I find interesting. And I also find it, uh, interesting, the response from some, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine a couple of days ago, an American individual, his family is all in the military, his brother's best friends, uh, a seal and diagnosed with mm -hmm. PTSD. Now my friend's wife was yep. in a horrific car accident and brain injury, a few other things, but she was diagnosed with PTSD. And when this Navy SEAL fellow heard about this, he lost it. He's like, how the hell does she have PTSD from this little car accident? And she hasn't seen the horrors that I've seen. And I, I guess it comes down to the perception of what PTSD is and, and it's constantly changing. I guess to some degree with the lack of understanding, there's going to be a level of ownership that people take over it. They, they maybe wear it. And instead of being, Hey, I'm, I'm Bob with the broken foot. No yep. one would say that, but they, they will say, Hey, there's Bob with PTSD. And I think that adds to the social stigma associated associated with PTSD. Cause personally, I think it's a very natural thing. I think it's absolutely natural for somebody who's gone through the things that you've gone through to have the same physiological and, and psychological response. And it's evident in the fact that lots of other people go through the exact same thing as well. Yeah. And you know, and I, and I really, and I really feel for some of those people, like for civilians, <clears throat> because they end up, you know, having, you know, some of the same issues that we do and there's, they, they don't have the same support structure mm -hmm. that those of us who are who are served in the military or our first responders and uh and like i said you know I, i've seen i've seen the civilian side because of because of my kids or because of other family that have had to go through this this the you know public health system uh in canada when i was going through early treatment for ptsd and it's part of it like my th one of the things they tell you in therapy is you start to change how you react or look at things right mm. so i used to i used to get angry at civilians in the workplace because you know they'd freak out if the photocopier stopped working <laughs> like to them like was that was absolutely the worst day ever and i was right. like seriously it's not life or death you were right. shot at like you know seriously and I found actually getting shot at was both exhilarating and terrifying at the same moment. Mm. Um, so you're like, cool, I'm getting shot at. Holy crap, I'm getting shot at. Right. Uh, anyhow, um, so, but then it was started, you get to, you flip that upside down and you're like, yeah, for most civilians, the worst day in their life is going to be when that photocopier doesn't work, when they, they're five minutes from doing a, a presentation because one, they're not trained the same as we are. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have prepared you know, they're waiting to the last minute to make those photocopies rather than planning well in ahead. <laughs> right. And you know, all those types of things. So they're just not, they just don't see the world the same way we do because, Hey, I've, I've been, been in the army since I was 19. Mm. So my brain, so one of the things they found too, like for those of us who join, you know, 18, 19, our brains are still adapting and molding. So mm. by 25, it, your human brain doesn't really start solidifying itself till it's about age 25. Right. And my dad used to say, you don't grow a brain until you're about 25. Yeah. So, so for a lot of us who have served in the military, especially guys on the pointy end of the spear, 
and you learn to be hyper vigilant, you know, and you've been trained mm -hmm. that way since, you know, you were like 18. Uh, my sons are joining the Army Reserves. Um, and I got one who's probably going to join when he's 16. So, so when you mm. start training kids that are 16, 17, 18, and you're training them a certain way and you're teaching them to be on, it's, and they're on all the time until they're 25 and then their brain is just, is just stuck that way. Um, it's hard because the mm. army doesn't train you to integrate back into society. We train you to integrate into the military, right. but we don't train you to reintegrate back into society and how to and how to integrate to deal with mm -hmm. um, deal with civilians and interact with them, and that also you know for you know veterans and first responders that's that could be a trigger too. Just having to deal with people that just don't think or get it, you know, like we do. So, but yeah. I guess where I was sort of going with the perception of PTSD and what causes PTSD yep. and how the seal can be upset because somebody else is in a car accident and they haven't seen the same sort of things. I would have to imagine that with that perception, it can be difficult for those in the military and those that have, have served to come forward with issues of PTSD, if they personally look at their situation, maybe not as bad as the JTF yep. two fellows situation, or, you know, I, w I was in some stuff, but I shouldn't complain because this person seems fine. And they're in a whole bunch, whole lot worse than I was. And I think just, well, I guess I'll just ask, do you find that? Is that something that you see that people would be embarrassed or afraid to come out because they I uh, don't feel that their level of experience meets a threshold for PTSD or what they feel PTSD is. Yeah. You know, and, and I know guy, I know guys today who have hunted with this, who are hesitant to, to still put in a claim, uh, with veterans affairs for, for mental health, because they're like, well, there's other guys that need it more than me. You know what? Like seriously put it in, let the, let the medical practitioners be the ones who make the final decision um with whether or not you you need to be you need to be treated that's one of the reasons why i talk so candidly and as much as i can about my own ptsd is really just to encourage other guys to to come forward it, it's not you know what it's not a stigma mm -hmm. it, it's you know what it's something that happened and for me i wouldn't be in a situation to be able to serve soldiers again with the veteran hunters had i not got the ptsd that i that i did get mm -hmm. and i look back and look at the journey so yeah, they redacted my files and yeah, I went through seven years and this kind of stuff, but it set me up for, to be in a perfect situation to be able to have these discussions, to encourage and inspire others, to start an organization like the Veteran Hunters and then really relate to guys. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I wasn't downrange in Afghanistan, but you know, I served in the former Yugoslavia and just as a note, actually the the guys who served in the former Yugoslavia, we are the we are the largest group of veterans that are that are currently being treated. Um, you can go on hmm. uh, Vax uh, site. Like we're in the tens of thousands of guys. In 2017, there were about 7,500 Afghan veterans that were being treated for PTSD, and they were a fraction of of the overall guys getting treated. And based on my experience, you it takes a guy about five to eight years before they actually are in getting treated because it, there's that there's that journey where you have to get to the right frame of mind where you're you're able to seek and accept uh, help and treatment because mm. um, a lot of guys like me, like in two thousand one, I wouldn't have been ready for treatment. I'd have been like. No, I don't have PTSD, and it would probably would have triggered me more and made me more angry. Right. It, it would have actually given the, the the mental health practitioners more ammunition to say yes, you do, because the more I resisted. Mm. But in you know in 2012, I was definitely in a place where I wanted to get better and wanted to get treatment. You know, the unfortunate part is you know you know I wasn't the best father or husband for that first 13 years before I started getting treatment. Um, mm. and so when I think about that, that can really depress me, but I don't want to go there. I don't like to go there. I kind of look at the here and now and, and I spend a lot of time with my kids and, 
Um, heck, I don't know too many kids that can say they've been to Africa hunting with their dad like twice. No kidding. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I have kids that have like top 50, top 100 uh, SCI animals. Holy crow. Yeah, I always had a passion to go to Africa and I'm one of these guys that's like, I'm not going to Africa when I'm 70. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I put a, little bit of mon put a little bit of money aside that I'd received from Veterans Affairs and took my whole family and we spent three weeks in South Africa and the outfitter that I hunted with, Rob Birch, Royal Crew Safaris, they're a sponsor of the Veteran Hunters. He's become a great friend and we're like family. And yeah, I know it's, uh, it's great. And actually our animals from the last trip are probably getting shipped this week, only about a year and a half behind schedule, but- That's know, fantastic. That's yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, so I try and make up for the past in the present, so. Have you ever read the book, Man's Search for Meaning or heard of it? No, you just made an interesting uh, comment and it was a book, it's an old book. It's translated in a bunch of different languages, but, uh, sure. you, you said, if not for my experience, I would not be in a position to help others. And I like that. I mean, that that's a really positive way to frame what's happened and really change essentially the way that you're looking at things and change the way that you will respond to it is that conscious you know i think it's 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 part of the the other side of treatment and therapy where you're kind of and i was fortunate that with part of my treatments you know i um i did i was able to do a master's degree so i did a master's of science in international construction management because when i've been in oil and gas i had been doing a lot of project and maintenance management as well so they were looking for ways to build on my existing res civilian resume and mm -hmm. get me back in the workforce. So it was one of those things. But with that, I had to do a dissertation and I did one on a uh, landmark study on leadership styles of project and construction managers in the oil sands mm -hmm. and did a bunch of surveys and did some comparative analysis for uh, four other regions in the world that, that were, you know, uh, heavy on project uh, and construction management. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I found was you know, why I struggled, uh, in, in, um, you know, the oil sands was, man, my leadership style did not fit the prominent style that's used in oil and gas mm. in Alberta. So they use, they'd use a total authoritarian style. Um, right. so they, so they, they bounce off between authoritarian or laissez faire, depending on how politically sensitive the decision is. Whereas I use a servant leadership style. Mm. So basically, I think from there, it just started building more introspective. You know, I was able to start thinking more about how I fit and, you know, um, your purpose. What am I here for? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and that's, and that was one of the things that I struggled with. You know, when you can't soldier anymore, it's like, what's your purpose? Cause as guys, you know, we don't look at the, the meat, the real meaning is, you know, we're, we're fathers and husbands, right? Mm -hmm. That should, that should mean a lot to us. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, we're guys and we're like, you know, uh, what do you do? And even in the <laughs> army, it's like, okay, are you, you know, are you a regular army? Are you a special forces guy? Or and then the regular army, you're like, oh, do you have jump wings and all that kind of stuff? It's right. like, you know, we try and uh, compare ourselves based on who we are and what we've done. And then when you can't do it anymore, it's like, you know, who are you? Yeah. Who am I? What's my meaning, my purpose. Right. And, and, and I found that I found meaning and purpose again, when I started hunting again mm. and i found that you know when i got into archery that it started reinforcing the mindfulness techniques and the grounding techniques and then when i coupled that with the hunting piece bow hunting is 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 hard mm. and i i choose to make it even harder for myself i i spot and stock with bow so now i'm having to use all the skills that the army taught me to hunt a human being mm. which if you've hunted animals with bow spot and stock Man, hunting humans is way easier mm. than than hunting, you know, the smartest mule deer or elk or uh, or a white tail or stuff like that. Mm. And so, to, so, you know, I remember one season, I broke my collarbone in the summertime, uh, mountain biking with my boys, and then I was bow hunting that fall, you know, with a broken broken collarbone. So, really, it was just looking for things to work on because I knew I couldn't make a long, long bow shot given the broken collarbone. Mm -hmm. um, so I worked really on my stocking 
And really, you know, I stalked this mule deer buck for an hour and a half and came face to face with him. And for me, you know what, that was, that was it. That was awesome. Cause I knew, you know what, if I'd been healthy and you were bigger, then I was in a position to, to take you. Mm -hmm. So in my own mind, you know what, that was, that was, you know, that was meaning and purpose. I was able to use those skills that I'd learned. I still had it, you know, as a soldier that I could still do this stuff. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny. I found actually, um, going to Africa for a hunt was actually really nearing, I was nearing the end of my treatment and found that going to Africa was a really good way to kind of close the books on my PTSD, you know, my ability to shoot and to soldier. And, um, because where we hunt, where I hunt in Africa, you know, it's, it's spot and stock with rifle and bow. And, you know, it's five guys in a, in a Jeep. So it's, you're out early morning. So it's kind of like being in the army and you're in rugged terrain mm-hmm. and, um, you're making, in some cases, making long shots and that kind of stuff. So again, it was for me, it was like, you know, just reinforcing the positive things that I liked, that I liked about the army. And then you reinforce like success. You know, I remember the last shot I made to the first time I went to Africa, it was a 300 meter shot on sticks, 642 feet, different elevation and an animal running uphill, passing another animal. And I hit him in the vitals and then put wow. a second round and broke, and broke his femur. Right. And, uh, I was like, done, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, that's, uh, I don't know if I could make that shot again today, but, um, <laughs> but, at but that I'll time, take it. You know, and it. Yeah. And what at that time to drop that kudu the way that we did was, you know, yeah, it was, it's um, impressive. I was elated. Yeah. I was elated. And it just proved that, no, I still, though I'm not wearing a uniform anymore, anymore, I still have what it takes to soldier. Mm-hmm. So have you seen the short video i think sitka put it out called a place of peace yes yeah that's a great that's a totally resonates with me that's a great piece that they did i'll put a link to it in the in the podcast and on on the youtube here so that other people listening can can watch that but when you're talking there that just kind of came to mind you mentioned something about brain development and being about 25 when the brain starts fully coagulating and solidifying yeah. and into something. And you talked about the brain being stuck and from some of the reading and research I've done, people are talking about neural plasticity and the fact that the brain can basically create new neural pathways and it's mm-hmm. something that's being used for PTSD. And I guess when we talk about being able to take an x-ray and there it is, you can see the broken bone, but it's not as self-evident in a mental health injury, uh, they're finding that, uh, essentially three main parts of the brain are being affected. The amygdala where your emotions are affected, your hippocampus where your memory is and mm-hmm. your prefrontal cortex or planning, cognitive function, short term memory, all of these sort of things kind of take place. Yep. Um, I think looking at that and knowing a little bit about some of the, the new techniques that people are dealing with. Do you think that really a person's brain is stuck at 25? Let's say they've got the PTSD ingrained them at that point. Are, are they stuck or do you think they're able to find proper function and, and enjoy through whether it's sort of a cognitive based therapy or some sort of a uh, mixture of, uh, medications and different types of talk therapy and, or, or do you think it's just something that it's going to be cemented in? Well, I think, you know, I mean, the trauma, the trauma piece is is cemented in, or the hypervigilance piece is probably, probably cemented in. Okay. Um, and, and there's a part of it that where, you know, the day I broke my collarbone Mm. was like the best day ever. And for, so for those of us who've been like trained to deal with emergency situations. So a lot of us, like we don't, our PTSD doesn't prevent us from handling an emergency situation, Mm. like an active shooter or dealing with a medical emergency or that kind of stuff. Sure. We actually, it actually works the opposite. We thrive. Because that's the best. Your outside matches your inside. What's happening outside matches what's going on in your head. Right. So it's, so that's the best drug, drug piece ever. Right. right? The problem is, is that you can't, you can't live that way. Right. Even Mm. though your brain loves that, you can't live that way. So 
I'll try and answer this as best as I can and, and succinctly. So for me, one of the things I think anybody with, you know, PTSD, if they're in a position where they're willing to get better, can. I'll speak from my own personal perspective. So for me, we looked at it from a holistic standpoint. So yes, I had talk therapy. I did uh, EMDR. Right. was the therapy that worked for me. Not not the light bar, but my therapist using his hand up and down. The finger back me. and forth. And, yeah. And, yeah. and just for, for the, listen, the listeners who are might not be familiar with it. That's uh, you can you can do tapping. You can do uh, eye eye light bar going back and forth, tracking a finger. But uh, essentially, it's taking from the hippocampus a long term memory, and you're recalling it as a short term memory, and you're essentially f- fuzzing it out by looking back and forth really quickly or tapping really quickly, yeah. and it, that that would be an accurate description, right? You're, you're taking yes. the emotional yeah. impact no. out of the M. Yeah. Uh, uh, the memory. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, so, so we've got, so we're talking about, uh, we've got the talk therapy in there. We've got the MBDR, um, drug therapy. Uh, so finding the right, so I'm on three different meds the rest of my life. And for some guys, you know what, the, the meds aren't their thing and they find other things, but I'm just talking about my own personal. Mm-hmm. So I found, you know what, physical fitness. Um, staying right. active right? and because, you know, I mean, our brains, my brain got injured in Kosovo because I was sleep deprived. So actually, you know, I have permanent, uh, insomnia, mm. um, as a consequence to my PTSD. So I actually wake up, I wake up every day more tired than I was when I fell asleep. Um, Jeez. so for me, morning hunts are really hard. <laughs> no so, kidding. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but uh so yeah and then you know good sleep and a good like a good social network so i had no veteran buddies at all when i was going through treatment i had no mentoring at all i knew nobody else at the osi clinic that i was going through there was no group it was you know what it was me my wife you know my parents um my our church you know that was kind of my social my social network right yeah so that was kind of like you know those multiple factors and you have to it's something you have to work at yeah it's like you you can't go to the gym and try and work out with a trainer and expect to be fit if you don't put the reps in right and there are you know and and there are some guys out there that 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 are stuck that are stuck in a rut with their ptsd because they just can't you know can't get the tire out of the out of the hole right and you know and i feel and i feel for those guys and you know one of the things with the veteran hunters is really helping guys overcome that anxiety because that anxiety piece really will can rob you of having a very fruitful and productive life Mm. um you know i'm i'm 48 years old man i got a lot more years to go and and i love hunting with guys most of the guys that i that i take out hunting are 10 to 15 years younger than me and this old guy is just pounding them into the dirt. So it's awesome. <laughs> so, um, I can still, I can still rock with the rest, with the best of them. It's awesome. Well, um, want to talk about veteran hunters, how it got started? Sure. So I started looking around and found in Canada, there was no hunting organizations that focused on veterans and dealing with mental health and that kind of stuff. But there were lots of guys in the U S in fact, I connected with one guy in Oregon in particular. 22 Outdoors is uh, the organization in Oregon. And hopefully, you know, big picture, long down the road, we're, we're able to do a joint hunt, uh, whether whether here in Alberta or in Montana. Well, that'd be cool. Um, for elk. Yeah, it's kind of something he and I have talked about, kind of big picture down mm-hmm. the road. So just, you know, threw the dice, put it out there, and came up with the term veteran hunters. So one, I mean, it, I like kind of using plays on, playing on words, having kind of worked with the media and stuff in the past. Yeah. So, you know, we're veterans and we're hunting, but we're also hunting for veterans. We're trying to find guys to connect with and to get into the organization and find out about the organization and that kind of stuff. So um, there's a little bit of duology there. So started the Veteran Hunters, got the website up and running, self-funded for the first year, um, connected with, you know, the right guys on social media who helped, you know, get us some exposure. We did a snow goose hunt that first year in 19. 
And then it kind of just snowballed from there. And by the end of 20, uh, 2019, we'd facilitated activities for, for over 50 guys. We had been talking to sponsors throughout the year, in particular Vortex Canada, uh, who came on board right away at the beginning of this year. They've been a great sponsor. Red Wales, one of their field reps, uh, he served in Croatia uh, with the RCR, mm. um, was injured himself. So, I mean, so there's some, some, some personal things there when you look, when you're looking for sponsors, right? So if you've got, you know, veterans inside another organization, um, that are, that are able to vouch for you too, it, 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 it helps. Mm-hmm. Um, but they've been really generous with us this year and there are still people out there and I won't name organizations, but there are organizations out there that are paid to support veterans who market their products using the veteran name. Okay. Um, but do not agree that veterans with PTSD should be hunting or using firearms. Okay. Yes. So, um, so we've run into, the, run into those challenges. Yeah, that's going to be difficult. Um, yeah. And you just kind of have to wash your hands of that one because I could see that being one of the things that could bring in, what, what was the term you used? The uh, passionate frustration? Oh, yeah. I can feel it right <laughs> inside myself, especially when you got on the record. Like I did a podcast with a psychologist from the Operational Stress Injury Clinic saying we are doing, the, what we're doing is exactly what some veterans need. Right. Every veteran, some or first responder. Yeah. I mean, Not all. But we were, there, we were a gap. I mean, right. um, you know, uh, there's two groups doing fishing in Canada and we are the only ones doing hunting. Right. We're the only organization of our kind and we're a national organization this year. So I had, so I have volunteers in BC. I have volunteers in, uh, New Brunswick and uh, Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and I mean majority of our hunts are here in Alberta and we've mm. actually had we had guys fly out from Ontario wow. to hunt elk this year um, we had got we had a guy last year fly out from Ontario to hunt because actually we found out like uh, we can actually bring veterans here into Alberta for a really reasonable rate with what we're doing right so we're not an outfitter have a great relationship with the outfitters association but we're, we're hunter hosts so back to your initial question so what we do is every year i sit down with the various hunter hosts and and i'll probably i'm going to bring on a few more guys next year and uh we basically we'll sit down for a day probably this year will be like on a zoom call or something like that and uh we'll hammer out kind of the hunting schedules tentatively especially the spring ones. We'll try and get them up right away. So if a veteran is out there, if actually, if you were to Google veteran hunter or veteran hunters, we're probably the uh, number one Google search that'll come up. So that makes it easy. Yep. You go on there and you'll find, you'll scroll down and you'll look at our calendar and really, you know, we'll post all of the, all of their dates. And those are the dates that our hunter hosts uh, put up and say, Hey, I'm willing and able to take a guy for this period in this locale for this specific animal. And really it's connecting with the organization, which would be me by email. And I try and talk to every, every veteran that connects with our organization. We've got over 500 now in our Facebook group. So if I don't get back to you right away, it's nothing personal. It's just, um, I'm a busy guy. Just one man. uh, Just one man. Yeah. So it's just one man. And you know what? I'm a father with teenagers and, uh, you know, I'm married and I've got, you know, this is supposed to be a side, supposed to be a side thing, right? Not my full time. So that's the whole work-life balance piece. So, so veteran would pay their own way, come on out, be set up with somebody from the organization. Yep. And when you guys go out, they've got the opportunity to connect with somebody else who may have similar life experiences and may be in a better place than they are. And able to help them navigate from where they are now to, to someplace better. Is that essentially the crux? Yeah, that's, that's, that's essentially it. Yeah. Basically you contact us, tell us what you're interested for dates. You know, we'll connect you. Yeah. You get your, you get yourself here, uh, and we'll take care of, we'll take care of the rest. If you need accommodations, we'll, we'll sort that out for you, uh, at a reasonable, at a reasonable cost. And it's not, um, essentially they've got a hunting buddy, but not just any hunting yeah. buddy, somebody who's uh, receptive somebody and who's, helpful. Right. Who's, who's walked in their shoes. Right. You know, I, I use these, I use these analogies, you know, I mean, 
One of the things about veterans hunting with veterans or veterans hunting with like, you know, first responders, that kind of stuff. A lot of first responders are, are veterans themselves. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they just transitioned from the army into the, being a police officer or paramedic or mm-hmm. firefighter. Um, it's just, it's similar, similar work, but just different, mm-hmm. but it's similar stresses. Is it when, so when you're hunting, you wake up in the morning and everyone pulls out their Ziploc bags with their meds. We all kind of laugh and look at each other and it's like, there's a level of comfort, right? You're not having to explain anything. Everybody knows where you're at. You know, yeah. um, we talk about like having, you know, irritable bowel. Well, when you, when I pull over the truck, the three other guys in the truck probably have to go at the same time. So we're all laughing about this. So, so it's funny that you're talking about being candid. Like, I mean, sure. I'm, I'm totally candid totally. because, you know, it is just. It is what it is. It, it is what it is, right? And, and so it's awesome. And, and when you're hunting with guys and a guy looks at you or I look at a guy and I go, hey, man no stress. Like you let me know when you're ready to go. I'm going to grab another cup of coffee. You want one? Yep. And when you're ready, we'll go hunt. And you know, one of the, uh, a good friend of mine, um, and former co-host on my podcast, uh, Bryce, he talk. he calls it, you know, windshield therapy. He oh, says, yeah. If you know, if you're, yeah, you're to and from the hunt, you're, you're talking to a guy and you're sharing your experiences. And, uh, you know, we've had, you know, one of the guys who flew out here last year, he got his PTSD from the Swiss air disaster. He was in mm. the Navy and having to clean that up for three weeks. Well, he couldn't fly for 12 years. Mm. And the first time he got on an airplane was to fly out here and hunt with us. Wow. And it actually was, he flew on the anniversary of the Swiss air disaster, but he, for, but for him coming out here to Alberta for the first time and pursuing elk with a backpack was more important than you know he just he just wanted to experience that good for him and we and we did a podcast with with damon when he was here and then when he went and then a couple weeks later when he went home and actually we've stayed good friends and i was talking to him yesterday and um yeah the lasting and lingering effect positive effects of coming out and participating in the hunt is huge and he was going on, um, they were doing a family trip to like Costa Rica and he was starting to get kind of ex- the anxiety from mm. flying on another airplane. I said, hey man, go back and listen to your podcast. Listen to your own voice telling you right. how therapeutic it was. And he was like, oh yeah, that's, what a great idea. So that's why I encourage guys, you know, I said, check out our website, you know, look at the hunts. There's 35 podcasts from last year where we talked to countless veterans um, they talk about their own post-traumatic stress story. They talk about where they are now and the successes. And the segue in, and that's one of the things we're going to foc- we focused on with the, the the veteran hunter show that's going to the Sportsman's Channel. Is every episode we're looking at a veteran or a first responder. Well, they'll talk about their journey, mm. but their the, but their success today. So we've got veterans who who have their own businesses. They've overcome their PTSD and have their own businesses. Right. Or they're like me and they're they're running another nonprofit organization that's uh, trying to help, you know, first responders. It's just to help people, encourage people. And then there'll be, a, the, one of the episodes will be about me and it's kind of, mine I think is going to be a bit of a compilation. It's got to go to the editor still, but mine will probably be a compilation showing how, you know, I get, th- um, for me, it's therapeutic serving the other guys right. having been a former officer and it's funny you liked my tagline on my uh on my cell phone i uh, saw that yeah emails. yeah so so in order to be a leader you must first be a servant right and so and i truly believe that and it's all that kind of from the adage you know know your men and promote their welfare mm-hmm. so i get therapy by uh running the organization helping out guys and there's countless guys who who have put up testimonials and we try and track those as many because sponsors love to see that stuff you know just talking about the the benefits mm-hmm. this year we you know we put activities on for over 75 guys um this year and we'll probably by the end of the hunting season um we still got some special elk seasons going on here in alberta so we'll probably have put on a combined like 190 days of, of hunting uh this year wow yeah and, and that's kind of that's yeah and that's a that's a max capacity i think for 
for where we're at right now. So we need to kind of grow the organization a little bit more. And that's great, you know, by bringing on a guy like Jeff to look after, they'll do the whole sponsorship mm-hmm. piece because that's a that can be a full time job. Looking for organizations to to, to help us with either gifts and kind or dollars to to help the operation. So, well, is there anything else we should be talking about? Anything that you think we should be getting out there before we start looking at wrapping up here? I think, you know, it's just, you know, letting other veterans and first responders know, you know what, you're not alone. There are over 500 people on our Facebook group. There's countless guys the last and ladies the last couple of years that have, that have hunted with our organization or that I've spoken with, just encouraging you to push through the anxiety. Don't let it rob you of your life, both, both physically and, and mentally. You know, don't let the demons win. When we were all in training, we would push through the demons and finish that ruck march. Or we would push through the struggles overseas or push through anything to, to survive and to get home. And now that we are at home, continue to push and push through the struggles because that's, that's what made us who we are as soldiers. Mm. And don't lose the battle here at home. Continue to fight. And you're not alone. Connect with us. You know, we brought on a chaplain this year, one of the pastors from our church came on this year and he's available. You know, you can connect with him through our website. And uh, and if not, they can shoot me an email as well or connect with us through Facebook. And we can, you know, we can help you with that mental health piece or the peer support piece. You know, I've talked to every person, every veteran that's connected with us. And it's been good because there's, there's guys I know that I can't put together because they'll trigger each other. Mm-hmm. But that's another learning too, is that not all veterans can be with each other right. because of their overseas experiences. So that's why I talk to everybody that wants to hunt with the organization just to know where they're at. And if you want to hunt with us too, we'll send you, we send you, we, we developed a, a forum this year um, that asks some personal questions, but it just helps us better prepare ourselves and you to hunt with us. Todd. Thank you very much for being on the Silver Core podcast. I'm really impressed with what you've done so far. I'm really excited to see where Veteran Hunters is going to be going in the future. And I'm very happy to be able to assist you with your endeavor in any way we can. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Appreciate it.